the world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to ReBank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to ReBank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. The fintech industry has rapidly matured in recent years. Once a collection of aspirational early-stage founders catering to tech early adopters, fintech companies are increasingly offering highly respected, professional-grade solutions to mainstream consumers and businesses. Challenger banks, online lenders, payments companies, and API connectivity layers once competed for fringe customers in a handful of urban centers. Now, they're pursuing global rollouts, pushing $10 billion valuations, and piquing the interests of incumbent acquirers from FIS to Fiserv to Visa. How far will private funding take fintech? Will a wave of IPOs follow? Will M&A entice leading startups before their valuations make takeovers uneconomical? What will happen when local fintech successes clash at the global level? This special episode was recorded live at a ReBank event in London. The evening was hosted by Sherman and Sterling, a global law firm with a specialist fintech practice. Visit fintech.sherman.com to find out more. In this conversation, I'm joined by Noel Monroe, director at Rothschild and Company, an investment bank, Tim Levine. CEO of Augmentum Fintech, a venture capital firm, Ian Sutherland, CFO of Tide, a business banking service, and Pavel Shaya, capital markets partner at Sherman and Sterling. For all of our past episodes and to sign up to our newsletter, please visit bankingthefuture.com. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Noel Monroe, Tim Levine, Ian Sutherland, and Pavel Shaya. All right. Thank you, Barney, for the very generous words. My experience is nothing compared to the experience of the four panelists that we have here with us tonight. Um, So maybe to kick off, uh, they can introduce themselves very briefly. I start. I'm Noel Monroe. I work at Rothschild and Co. I'm in their equity capital markets advisory team. Where I'm focused on advising companies and their shareholders on the IPO process. And we, we work as an independent advisor throughout the whole of the IPO process. Uh, Tim Levine, the CEO and founder of Augmentum Fintech. We are the UK's only publicly listed fintech fund. Uh, prior to Augmentum, I was one of the original team at a business called Betfair, which we started back in the late 90s. It's a long time ago now. Uh, Ian Sutherland, I'm the CFO at Tide. We are uh, our fintech specializing in banking services for small businesses. Uh, very proudly have Augmentum as an investor. Um, we've been going for about three years and now have 140,000 small businesses on the platform two and a half percent market share in the UK. And I'm Pavel Shai. I'm a partner here in the Capital Markets Group at Sherman and a member of the FinTech Foundry program in London. Excellent. All right. So maybe to kick things off, uh, I can ask Tim a uh, hard and unscripted question, just like I promised I wouldn't right before we got up here. (laughs) So based on your experience, right, you talked about having been involved in Betfair uh, since the the late 90s. Um, You've seen uh, more than one business cycle before. Um, You've been involved in fintech for a a number of years now. Um, You've watched the trajectory from uh, nascent industry, very early companies, excitement about pre-seed, seed, seed, A-stage funding to what is uh, in many respects fundamentally different industry now uh, with the the likes of the largest banks in the world. Um, Goldman Sachs comes to mind fundamentally repositioning uh, t- toward you know, increasingly fintech-style uh, plays. 
the the M and A activity, the consolidation in the, in the payment uh, space last year. You know, FIS and Pfizer leading the the charge there. Uh, Visa's acquisition of Plaid earlier this year. It feels in many ways like the industry is is maturing, is shifting from early stage uh, three coders in a garage style innovation to heavily funded corporate led innovation um, as large companies kind of understand that the world around them is changing. Do you think that's a fair characterization? And is there anything that you would add to that? People will look back on where we are today, maybe the last couple of years in 10 years time. And those that didn't get exposure to this sector um, through investment will scratch their heads and said, you know, what on earth was I thinking uh, when we've seen so many other industries many years before go through similar disruptions? I mean, financial services has just been the slowest industry to disrupt because it's heavily regulated and very complicated. And a lot of the innovation hasn't come out of the valley. It doesn't per- doesn't really permit it um, as a result, some of those factors. So, you know, I would say over the last five years, we've started to see that real momentum change. And I think you are now seeing uh, the capital come into the market. London is incredibly well placed and um, has been ahead of the curve. And that's been, um, you know, for a lot of good reasons, including regulatory and uh, government support and obviously the city of London, the infrastructure that we have here. So, yeah, I think all signs are pointing to an industry that is um, well beyond the point of no return. So the genie's out the bottle. The question is, how far is it going to go? How big are the businesses uh, going to be built before they're taken out, IPO'd, um, or something else? And, you know, the Plaid deal um, was just one uh, example, but I think there'll be many more examples of incumbents sitting there and seeing a real threat, not just of new competition, but of their traditional competition potentially acquiring these businesses before them. So I, you know, I'd say we're at the end of the beginning, but there's a long way to go. Noel, from your standpoint, um, you know, you're day in and day out working on some of these uh, t- types of transactions. I, I think. I think the, the the piece that you know this conversation will end up in part focusing around is this kind of path from you know w- what happens like post Series C, right? So we're like increasingly in in a world where fintechs are are maturing, people are raising larger rounds, people are raising growth rounds, uh, people are um, as a result of the size of the rounds that they're raising, the valuations at which they're raising, um, they're in many ways shaping their own destinies. Um, once you raise at a specific valuation, you know, in the in the billions, you know, five five plus billion, th- there's really no, you know, there's no way back from that. Uh, I think, especially if you um, if you raise on a vision and you raise on customer numbers rather than raising on unit economics, and that's another piece which I which I think we can dive into a bit more uh, deeply. But just in terms of in terms of what you're seeing, the types of conversations you're having, and your broader experience uh, at working in this in this space, uh, even even outside of fintech, where where, where are we in um, in the kind of maturation of the of the industry? It's a, it's a good question, and and I think that the important thing to think about is an IPO is not a one size fits all um, transaction. There's all sorts of types of IPOs, and it, that, that's the beauty of them is is that they can be so flexible. You can have very small IPOs or listing on AIM. Um, you can have you know anything up to you know Saudi Aramco or Alibaba.com or whatever in the many billions. And and you can have deals that where you're effectively raising a small amount of growth capital, or you can have IPOs which are <coughs> basically seller um, shareholders cashing out and and new investors coming in. So. Is not one size fits all, and the most important thing is, is that that companies and their shareholders look at their own objectives and have a real think about what are the options available to them. Continue with private funding, um, sell, partial sell, or, or IPO, and and it's going to depend on the market. It's going to depend on their objectives. I think when when should a company think about IPO? I think there's a few boxes that they should tick in in order for it to be a success. 
and um, success, we should say, is is um, subjective. Uh, you know, different people's success are different things. But I think uh, you, the company needs to be mature enough to be able to guide the market. Um, you know, two years out, one two years out, roughly. Where where is it going? There needs to be a path to profitability that that they can show because that's what the public market investors are ultimately there for. It's not for the you know the the earlier dream as much as more for when when are profits coming coming down the line, and I think you, the company should also be big enough to attract attention from the audience that it wants to uh, attract, and I think where we are at the moment, despite all the hype about IPOs in in the fintech, um, in a lot of pockets of fintech that have been, have been IPO payments is has been very active for IPOs. Um, um, financial platforms has been very active, but but sort of bank neo banks lenders has been pretty quiet. And and I think one of the reasons is they're just not ticking enough of those boxes. And there's another the factor which you're probably going to get onto. But the private market has been very very active, and therefore there's not been is the IPO is not the only source of capital anymore. Is one of them. Mm-hmm. <coughs> I well, if if I may, I, I, I just wanted to follow up what uh, what Noel just said. I think that point about the private markets versus the public markets is 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 an interesting point, right? We talked about um, the industry maturing, but at least in my experience and now experience, we see still a prevailing number of M and A transactions, private deals compared to IPOs, and I think there is there's a reason for that. Um, of course, if I put my securities hat on, I wish there were more IPOs, but for now it's more M&A. Um, here in the UK, I think the last big IPOs, I, I don't know if you agree, it's the funding circle probably um, in the industry. I think if the pure, like pure fintech. Yes, probably. the pure pure fintech IPO. What, what we have seen um, also generally as a trend is, I don't want to use the word skepticism, but the, the way how people perceive public markets, public equity markets is changing. And I think that's a development, right? The question is, are public markets still playing that role which would they which they were supposed to play, right? As a facilitator of growth, right? Of course, there is a regulatory burden. There is a burden of being a, a public company. Certain, certain businesses just don't like it. And it's much easier to live as a, as a private company. Now, related to that is, of course, the regulatory response and what we see, what happens um, on this side of Atlantic and also in the United States, right? Regulators are looking at private companies versus public companies. And now the question is, how are we going to make this, let's call it, uh, you know, level playing field, right? How are we going to make maybe the life of private companies slightly more difficult and the life of of um, the life of private companies more difficult, the life of public companies less difficult, right? So these are, at least in my mind, um, as, as a lawyer, these are interesting trends in the in the industry. Yeah. All right. So I heard, I heard Noel, uh, you know, this is coming to you. I heard Noel say that um, it's important for companies, especially as they're thinking uh, about, you know, what the kind of future state of their company looks like from a from a funding perspective specifically you were talking about gearing up for for ipo but that it's about showing profitability showing kind of traditionally you know important uh, business metrics those those business metrics haven't uh at least over the past few years necessarily been the drivers of earlier stage funding um and fair enough like if you if you're five people with an idea it's hard to show profitability so at some point, uh, funding has to fund vision, enthusiasm, team. Tim can run us through the list of you know, the things that early stage VCs look for. Uh, but, but Ian, as, as you get to the, the stage that, say, uh, Tide is at, which I think you guys have maybe raised a C round, how do you, a B round, how do you think about you know, where that transition occurs from uh, raising on aspirations to raising on um, metrics? And how you kind of prioritize and pull different different levers as you go? Yeah, it's a good question. I completely agree about the point Norma made earlier about the fact that you know 
getting to IPO stage and it needs a certain level of maturity. And we're certainly, as a, as a, fun, uh, a, a company that's just raised a Series B, we're, we're a few years away from that. Um, but we, we really think about you know, the metrics being, you know, about unit economics from this stage on, you know, from series B stage, these are the investors that are coming in at series B and then C are, are always looking at, you know, the, the profitability on a unit unit basis, really thinking about that um, operating leverage in the, in the company. Um, and that, that's really my experience is, you know, not necessarily it's about user growth, it's about showing that at a relatively early stage and then showing how we get from there to, to our, you know, a path to profitability maybe a bit further out than you know your traditional um, uh, public market investor would look at it, but you know investors who have a higher risk appetite, like at earlier stage in, in the in the ecosystem, are, are really thinking about you know, and they really understand that market. That's why we've got our fun, funds like Augmentum on board who really get fintechs and really understand you know where we're heading uh, going forward. So I think that 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 plays out in terms of how we think about the, the risk appetite from the investor side, but also from the company side. <clears throat> Tim, what, what's, your, what's your take on that same question? What's, what's more important, user growth or profitability? Um, so typically I'd say sustainable user growth um, that has a path to profitability. I mean, I think it depends where you are in the cycle. Two years ago, everyone was obsessed with user growth. If you looked at the neobanks in the UK, there was a land grab and it was a marketing fest. Um, and they were able to raise huge amounts of money off no underlying, underlying unit economics, frankly, because everybody was trying to get money into the ground. And the justification from the investors was these, you know, this is an operation that's one of the first to market they're going to win and we'll pay £2,000 a user. Now, there was often no logic. And so we're often accused as investors of being sheep, and that's often the way. And you can see the sentiment in our market in the last few months has changed. And so now, from user growth, it's all about we want profitable uh, you know, path to profitability and we want fundamentals uh, in, in the user growth. So the market is shifting post kind of soft bank uh, dynamic as well, who have kind of pulled away from the market. Uh, and there was a lot of, yeah, perhaps, um, you know, irrational behavior from not just fintechs, but other tech companies burning, you know, burning capital irrationally. Now, capital is starting to become more valued. Not to say that we don't have more capital than ever before, which is a fantastic thing for the ecosystem. Our approach as an investor has always been on sustainable businesses. We've always talked about unit economics um, and a path to profitability because we fundamentally believed in that. And uh, perhaps we've you know missed the boat on a couple of investments early on where we sat there, we looked at the business plan, we looked at the, the, um, the metrics, we looked at the valuation and just said, there's no way on earth we can justify this. Um, now, one or two of those bets might come off, but a lot of them, a lot of them haven't. And so we'll continue as a fund to remain pretty focused on businesses that we believe kind of have underlying strong business models. Not to say we fear uh, loss making businesses. We absolutely, you know, thrive on them because most of our businesses are loss making and uh, that's absolutely deliberate. I don't care if Ian uh, and the Tide team deliver uh, a bottom line of a million pounds profit if they're sacrificing sustainable growth. I want him and the team to grow as much as they can in a su sustainable fashion over the next two to three years. And when that sustainable growth stops, then you sit there and run the business for profitability. But, you know, they are in a in a land grab. They've done an extraordinary job um, over the past 18 months to go from zero to two and a half percent market share, which is no small feat in the, uh, in the SME banking market. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say the, the sentiment on the street at the moment is uh, let's see that path to profitability. And I think you will see some of the deeper pocketed funds, you know, hold back. Um, but the market and the mood can change quite quickly uh, as well. Now, interesting, because you, you talk about how it, it used to be the case in the UK that you were seeing these you know, massive rounds at, at very high valuations, which, um, fair enough, they're private companies, so it's not always easy to you know, run run the numbers for your yourself as an outsider. But um, maybe we aren't seeing those rounds in the UK anymore. Um, 
maybe a few different reasons. One of the reasons might be that there are you know, none or very few billion dollar plus funds to, to write, you know, increasingly massive checks, uh, though you are seeing those types of rounds. Um, yeah, certainly the revolutes of the world are talking about raising at a six billion valuation. Maybe um, you've got you know, U.S. Uh, digital banks who are who are raising those sums of money at those types of valuations. Is it that it's you know, that, that have investors genuinely refocused, uh, or is there simply more talk around prioritizing profitability in the immediate wake of the WeWork disaster? Um, that though, none, nonetheless, you know, we should, in a certain sense, appreciate that we're still in in a land grab in fintech in a lot of senses. Um, maybe we're in a land grab in the UK, you know, two thousand. 14 to you know 18 19 um in a certain sense we're still in the land grab in the uk but but actually to now justify some of these valuations this can't be a uk business and it can't even be a, a european business it has to be an international winner right no i mean you know not necessarily i mean we work is i think needs to be held in isolation it was a prob- it was a property business uh, masquerading as a high growth tech business i think um, a lot of funds are recalibrating as well as fintechs, but we are going to build some massive uh, billion pound plus businesses out of the UK. Um, and I think the difference when you talk about fintech being built out of, out of the UK is we can build global businesses um, and we're operating in a industry that accounts for 12% of GDP, depending how you cut it globally, um, 11 trillion dollars of revenue this is a big big opportunity so i think a lot of these businesses justify um the hype um but in some cases businesses are yet to grow into their valuations uh, in other cases they might be the right the right business model but the wrong companies being back so yeah i mean i i don't think we've suffered from uh excessive hype in fintech there will always be outliers and I think you'll see it this year. You've seen it in open banking uh, with Plaid. You'll see it with TrueLayer and you'll see it with Tink as well. There'll be some, you know, further kind of heavy capital going on these, uh, you know, on these subsectors as well. So, yeah, I still, you know, I still feel we, you know, as a as an industry measured, but I recognize that, you know, as Noel said, the IPOs haven't come and they won't come this year either. But that's not just because of, uh, uh, you know, the maturity of these businesses. It's the availability of capital uh, from alternative sources. <laughs> I, I want to I continue to, to pick up on that competitive dynamics point. So part of it is, um, you know, companies that were and, and in fact, the, the kind of open banking API la- layer is a, as good an example as any. Um, it's a race to European coverage. And then after that, it'll be a race to Australia coverage and Brazil coverage and every other market that follows on with with open banking. Um, and as a result, um, companies that were originally maybe like single market focused, and maybe they were the only player, the largest player in their own market are increasingly coming up against competition um, with successful players in other markets. Um, Ian, I'd be curious to know um, the, the the banking market generally, um, perhaps more on the consumer side than on the, on the SME side, but, but on the SME side, nonetheless, not least with the, the RBS um, remedies program, which, uh, which kind of worked its way through the system last year, Starling, Tide, Metro, there, there are a number of, companies who have started over the past five or so years, uh, built, you know, increasingly meaningful customer bases. H- how are you feeling that competition? Um, and, and how is it either honing your focus or changing the way that you, you know, think about the, um, your, your target market? So, on the, the competition point, I think the way we see the market is, and this is the reason the, the, the Remedies Fund was created, is that there's a 90% um, oligopoly really between the, 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 the largest five banks. So, so really when we think about competition, it's not Starling or other fintechs, it's really about that 90% market share and, and disrupting that. So that's really what Tide's always been about. And, and we haven't changed our focus. We've always said, it, 
this this market for SMEs requires focus on on SMEs, and and we still see that as being a huge opportunity. Um, fundamentally, that this this um, you know proposition of being an SME SME only bank hasn't really existed in the UK, uh, and and we still believe that Tide is very early in that journey. We we have you know a long way to to go to to help these small businesses you know fundamentally change the way they 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 run their back office and their finance. So we think we're probably 10, 20 percent into into delivering a fully featured product, and and that's even a you know a, a leading market product as it stands. So so when comes to Tim's point earlier about where where we're heading in terms of larger uh, valuations and exits and IPOs. I think you know we, while we've had a significant growth so far, at being you know two and a half percent market share, we, we ultimately see ourselves you know four four or five x that um, with you know a uh, you know four or five x bigger product, which will have you know uh, the the revenue and, and better economics associated with it. So so for for us, it's it's really you know very early stage of disruption, uh, and I think you know there's 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 big successes to come, not just in SME but in, in other places if you get it right. <clears throat> yeah. So people start thinking about questions. So we'll you know maybe run for another 10, 15 minutes, but then we want to get some uh, some Q and A from from the audience. Um, Noel, I want to pick up on one of the things that you said before, which was around uh, a greater availability of uh, capital in kind of late, late private market uh, funding rounds. What, what, are the, what are the implications for, for companies and for investors and for markets of, of that dynamic? Um, from my perspective, looking at the IPO market, it is just, it just mean there's more competition. Um, so probably short term selfishly i wish there wasn't so much com um you know competition but i think long long term it, it's a healthy dynamic it's good that there are there are more options available to companies and it means that everyone has to sort of change the way they look at um look at things and companies have to weigh up different options and it means talking to different people because you know it's not normally the same gatekeeper to certain forms of capital um but you know, we, we work very closely in my team with um, the people in our um, firm who work first both on venture capital and also sort of strategic capital, whether it's sovereign wealth funds or the large <coughs> pension funds. And we're seeing a lot more overlap and crossover. You're seeing um, the sovereign wealth funds and pension funds participate in IPOs. Uh, which they didn't, you, you know, for, even from their or semi semi private uh, pockets. You know, it, it is, and you're seeing them participate in pre IPO transactions with a, a view to owning long term. So it's the, these sort of completely separate. Um, oh, this is what an IPO looks like. These are the investors. This is what a series whatever looks like. This is these are the investors. This is what a classic pre IPO round looks like. I think you're seeing it, the edges being blurred a lot. And for companies, if they're careful about and get good advice and tailor what they, uh, the capital they get to their objectives, I think it's a good, it's a great position to be in. Ultimately, a lot of these companies have to face the choice of, do I want to be taken out on, on my journey or do I want to keep going on the journey indefinitely? And that's where the public market is the end the end route? It allows a company to have it more be in control of its own destiny on to keep doing funding rounds. Mm. And so, at the point when a company is more sustainable in its um, in its, in its um, you know, business, that that's a, you know it's a great it's a great route to be there with a long term permanent capital base. But um, I think it's it's a good <coughs> thing for companies to have the options. It's just as I think Tim you said earlier the. There is an element of fashion and sentiment, and it can change quite quickly in these different different pockets. So companies have got to be aware of that. I mean, one, just just on that, I think one of the big challenges is if you're a public markets institutional investor, you are really nervously looking at the lack of IPOs and, and thinking, how am I going to get exposure over the next decade to the very best tech growth companies, they're going to potentially miss out on one of the most exciting growth asset classes um, that, they, that they'll see in their investment lifetime. Because when you look at this capital, 
and the sovereign wealth and family office. And we've got $2 trillion of private equity in dry powder currently sitting on the sidelines. You've just got a wall of capital. And if you're the CEO or founder of a fintech or another tech business, and you have the choice between taking 100 million, 200 million from a family office or saying you can go public and all that comes with that, actually, I think, you know, nine out of 10 will say, do you know what, I'll, I'll hold off yeah, on that. Private. Yeah. And that's a, re- that's a real challenge. So how are these public institutions, how are the pension funds going to get exposure to this growth? Because if a, market, if a business is going to come to the market, it's going to come right at the top of the J curve. Look at Amazon 20 years ago. Look at Google. Look at what they listed at and look what they are now. And look at what public investors have benefited from that ride up. Look at Uber. Okay, now that's an extreme example, but that's the reality. They're missing out on the J-curve. They're coming in right at the top. Um, And so these institutions and pension funds who historically have gone into the public markets are going to have to look um, at coming private. Not not, not least because in many ways they're kind of custodians of retirees and pensioners and employees, you know, long-term wealth, right? So so maybe a question for Tim. I'm sorry, I'm not the moderator. So what what do you think is the is the way to bring more companies to public markets? Is there a way? Well, I think there's there's a lot of different factors. I think we talked about it a little earlier. Uh, I don't know why, but the, if you look at the analyst community and you look at public market investors, they're often glass half empty. The questions are, when are you going to become profitable? You know, yes, you've got strong growth numbers, but if you look at any press article, they'll talk about Revolut, they'll talk mm-hmm. about Moniz, they'll talk about Tidenals, and they're at the end of every article, and they lost 20, 30 million pounds last year. There's a real focus on that. And I think culturally, uh, the LSE struggles to embrace uh, companies that are still on that growth trajectory because there is this obsession with profitability, which might you know, well be fine. And I think we're now operating in an environment where these companies don't need to go public, but we want a burgeoning, a healthy stock market here in this country, because I think there's a, there's a great opportunity. So uh, I know LSE are, you know, scratching their heads and trying to do what they can, but it's a challenge. And so for us being public, you know, we, we are kind of one of the only routes, if you want exposure to inaccessible assets, but we'd love to see, you know, many more routes um, because that will become a magnet for capital as well. Mm. How do you, Tim, think about, you know, if you kind of look across your, your portfolio right now? I mean, um, obviously the, the end game for any venture fund is to you know, return money to, to LPs. Um, and that comes effectively through M&A or IPO. Um, how do you think about you know, which portfolio companies might be more um, relevant as potential acquisition targets versus uh, versus as you know independent companies uh, tr- traded you know traded publicly one day? Um, I mean, I think how I'd look at it is obviously on the maturity curve, which Noel was talking about before. We've got businesses that are profitable and clearly are on that path to IPO. Um, it wouldn't surprise me though if somebody uh, or a you know incumbent or others come knocking on the door before. So I think the good news for the ecosystem and for the industry is there are multiple exit opportunities, and that's great. So IPO isn't your only route. In, in fact, if that is your only route, then um, you're you're going to struggle um, unless you've got a very specific business model that lends itself very effectively to the uh, to the public market. So. Um, I mean, great businesses, exits take care of themselves. Um, the art is obviously when you don't have a great business and you've got to get out, <laughs> you've got to get out at the right time. And that's, that's the art of a, of a great investor as well as kind of having the easy option of having a great business that gets taken out. But you really will see, if you see the amount of dry powder from the incumbents as well on their balance sheets, and they've, they, they're spending about half a trillion a year in tech uh, investment on their own infrastructure, often aging infrastructure, that's not working. So they are ready to become acquisitive and they've got the balance sheets to do it. It's good news for you now. <laughs> yeah, and it, it is, I mean, I, it's frustrating because we see 
we see time and again private equity maybe taking out companies earlier or investing in it. The IPO being the route, but the being a route frustratingly probably one or two turns later than it maybe could have been or, or, or should have been. And therefore is that you know the public market is not seeing that that growth. And um yeah, I don't quite know how um you know, you talked about public market investors. Um some investors have wised up to this and they're participating in private investments. But we all know, you know, that's been happening for a while and there was a pretty famous uh, UK fund manager that was participating a lot in private companies and, and it got you know it, it can be difficult because they, they've got a, normally got sort of ten percent of the portfolio that they can own in, in, in private investments and you know it can things move, can move around uh, quite a lot and you can find yourself in, in a sticky place. They also the other Areas that there's no guarantee when the company will, when the exit will be, when the liquidity will come, but it's certainly it, on some probably the smarter investors' minds. It, it is is there as an issue they need to think about because they, they're, they're going to miss out on on that amazing growth. And then where the public market, you can see it when when companies do list, there's um, they will pay. Uh, I, I believe they will pay a quite a significant premium, public markets for. Growth that other, other, you know, when it's the growth is starting to become relatively boring, if, well, definitely boring from a VC perspective, but even you know, it doesn't quite work from a, a private equity. We're going to own this for three years and turn it around perspective. So, sort of twenty percent, fifteen percent EBITDA growth. You see the public markets paying, you know, quite considerable multiples for that. It's just they haven't quite got their head around the phase a bit earlier than that. That's I think it's hopefully moving in the right direction, but it'd be nice if there were a few more proof points for it. Excellent. All right. So I want to make sure you get some questions in. So uh, if there are any immediate burning questions, put your hand up. Otherwise, I'll keep grilling these guys. Question in the front. So when it comes to consolidation or acquisition, what is your opinion on acquisition of emerging technologies by big corporates? Sometimes it has a the effect of killing that innovation or that technology. So long-term disservice to the consumer. Quick question is, how do we think about corporates acquiring great technologies and effectively shutting off access for the, the rest of the, the market? Mm. That made that technology right, or just the corporate, the corporate, you know, killing the innovation. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the rule, <laughs> rather, <laughs> rather than the exception. Uh, I mean, there are so many examples in recent history of big corporates buying nimble, dynamic um, tech businesses and stifling that that innovation. Um, I think the trick is allow them to continue to operate as independently as possible. Um, and so I, I would say it will be interesting to see how Visa manage Plaid and uh, you know, how that works. Um, and, you know, we're going, we are going to see so many of these examples um, in, in the industry. And I think one of the reasons we're in such a vibrant uh, fintech industry is because the incumbents are struggling for those who've been inside large banks, large insurers. And, you know, we've, um, you know, we work with many who've come out and just said, you know, the talent was in there, but they were being frustrated. They just, these are slow moving oil tankers. It's very hard to, to move the needles. And also, you know, when you're HSBC and you're a $300 billion business, the ambition to build a billion dollar business for something that's non-core, a distraction, probably with reputational big, risk. And, yeah, it's bigger you know, fish to fry, coverage. which is you know, which is why we're in you know, the environment that we're in. Mm. Question in the back. Uh, hello. Um, so in 2017, <coughs> we saw these things called ICOs. Um, <coughs> I think uh, ICOs were a manifestation of exactly what you're trying to represent in terms of the retail market wanting access to that vast data of growth. How do we how do we capture that imagination from the retail perspective 
for the, the, the less sophisticated investor um, into a growth environment within Europe that is more legitimate, shall we say, than the ICO world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So the question is, how effectively, how do we facilitate better retail access, potentially in creative ways, to these private growth stage yeah, companies? How, how, do we, how do we open up the market to give access to that JPA? Yeah. So from an IPO perspective, on um, the, the trend really is how do we, rightly or wrongly, how do we prevent, and, and probably you'll know this, how do we prevent retail? from participating in an IPO from a risk perspective. Not as not, you know, that's just a, you know, because if you retail investors are allowed to access an investment, it heightens up the, the risk and the liabilities. And it's a frustration because as, as you, as you say, the, the area that an, um, an individual investor can participate most easily is, is in the stock market. You can, you can pick, pick stocks and, but it's much harder to participate in the private markets. Um, so I, I don't have an easy, I don't have an answer for it. It's just frustrating that even at IPO, there is a, it's very rare for, in the UK, it's different in other markets, but it's, it's rare in the UK for individual investors to actually be able to participate in the IPO. In the UK, IPOs don't tend to pop by 50, 100% on day one. So it doesn't, you know, if you can buy it day three, it doesn't, doesn't make, as much difference as in the states, arguably, but it is, um, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting question. Well, I mean, I don't want to talk yeah. my own book, but you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, you know, you've got to invest in augmented. I mean, you know, seriously, one of the reasons that we listed was, you know, democratization of access for retail investors to venture capital. It was historically the preserve of large U.S. pension funds, endowments, uh, and the like very hard for the retail investor to get exposure to this asset class. And we felt there was significant demand uh, and there was very little choice for, for the retail investor. And, you know, for us, if I look at our register, the fastest growing area of our register is retail. They're buying through the platforms, Interactive Investor, AJ Bell, Hargreaves Lansdowne. They're coming, you know, they are coming in. Uh, and that's great. And we love that because they are consumers of a lot of our portfolio. They're customers of Tide, of Zopa, of, you know, Interactive Investor, of, you know, Iwaka, uh, um, and many more. And that's really, really important. And you also have the likes of equity crowdfunding, which, you know, there was a, the snob value a few years ago. But now you'll see a lot of consumer uh, fintechs in particular want to give access to their customer base uh, to allow them to become shareholders because, mm -hmm. If you look at the net promoter scores, a lot of these fintechs, they're off, off the scale. They're north of 70. I mean, they love these brands. They have a very different relationship with their financial tech consumer businesses than they do with the traditional banks or the insurers. They really want to be part of that journey and own it. So I think, you know, ICOs in theory are a great idea. They just were unregulated and unfortunately brought in uh, the wrong the wrong type of the wrong type of people wrong type of companies someone sitting in front of you Lawrence Wintermeyer is an expert on that so you should grab him afterwards and uh, and get his uh, his take on it because uh, it's a really interesting and I think done right is a phenomenally interesting product uh, and one which I think we will see um, in the in the right structure regulated in the right way yes when we talk about fintech companies they're especially in the UK they're regulated already so you're going through a massive hurdle just to be a regulated financial institution in the UK. You then then take the next step to being a listed company. What is the biggest hurdle? Obviously, it's kind of MSB, but what is the biggest reason people don't want to take that leap? Because you're, you're going through that entire process with with the PRA, etc. Why why don't you want to just take uh, a yeah. great great question. So so the question is. If you're a fintech company, in many cases you're regulated already. In some cases, especially if you're a challenger bank, you're uh, highly regulated. What's the difference between that sort of regulation and the public scrutiny of, of being a, a listed public company? Yeah, I, I maybe maybe I address this one. It's um, it's the question that we get asked all the time, right? Life as a public company and what it means. And um, I mentioned previously, and, and we'll, we'll just mention the public scrutiny. And I think, I think that's the key, key point is that increased level of scrutiny, which 
manifests itself in a number of ways, right? There's an ongoing reporting obligations. There's an ad hoc reporting obligation requirement. Um, you need to actually speak to your investors, right? You need to have those meetings. And guess what? You need to open up your kimono. And that's, that's what it is. Many companies, um, I don't know, you know about you, but some companies don't like it, right? Um, it's probably, you know, not only about fintech, but generally. The regulatory compliance costs are significant, probably less, less so in, um, in Europe and in the UK, more so in the United States. Um, you know, everyone talks about Sabin's Oxley Act at some point and the onerous requirements that it brings with itself. Um, even though there is now a different type of issuers, which, which, which doesn't need to follow those rules for a number of years. But I think all, all that together makes life as a public company. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say there was a flip side to the coin. And there are, of course, many reasons why the, the companies do uh, list. And although there has been limited issuance in the fintech space, the, you know, the, the markets are still healthy and there are, you know, there are IPOs happening quite regularly. But the, you know, you, the company, there's no other route where you can uh, sell some, of, uh, raise some money and continue to ride on, on the upside whilst having liquidity, having a valuation that you can see on the screens, that the, the, the market can see, that can you can demonstrate that you're, you know, are you doing a good job, are you doing a bad job? You can use as an, your shares an acquisition currency. You know, there are, there are a ton of reasons why at the right time, at the right valuation, and if you can get the right investors' um, support, it can be a great opportunity for the, for the business in the long run. Um, but yeah, it is. If if any of those aren't right, you know, if it's not the right, it's not it's not worth doing at any cost. And and there's certainly p- companies need to go into it with their eyes open. Yeah, I think from from my perspective, we, you know, the, the regulation point is, you know, it can take a lot of work, and there's a lot of scrutiny around getting getting through that process. However, you know, being a mature business that has you know the uh, the predict predictable revenue streams um, at that stage of IPO is, is a different story. So you, while you might be held to account by a regulator on on certain metrics, the, the public markets will, will hold you to account on on many more metrics than than a regulator would do. Um, so you you need to be at the right level, at the right stage of business to to make that work. And and you not, you need to be able to kind of demonstrate that you are you know mature enough from from a revenue and profitability perspective. As we've been talking about a lot earlier, you know I, I can point to two you know quite good examples in the adjacent space to Tiden, um, Zero, who are very successfully listed um, uh, business in the small business accounting space, you know, a great, great story there and, and listed in, 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 a, in Australia, New Zealand, and then also Square, obviously, in, in the US. And these are, you know, businesses that have, you know, now hundreds of millions of, of revenue uh, and millions of customers. And I think that's the sort of like the, the, the place you need to be. So there are plenty of fintechs in the UK, which have millions of customers, but they don't have hundreds of millions of revenue. Um, and so you kind of need a, a mix of, the, of, of these things to make it work in the public markets. And, and we'll see more of that coming, but it might just take a bit more time in some of these um, uh, uh, challenger banking spaces. Yes. Um, so I'm a big fan of challenger banks. I've got my proud Monzo owner here. Um, and I, I, I really do love the challenger banks. I think they're great. You know, amazing apps. They work so well. Um, but I still have my salary paid into my Lloyd's account. I have my savings account, my NatWest account. And really, when I, when I look at my users of a Monzo account, it's more like a fun card. It's my night out in Shoreditch, stacked in Greece card. It's not so much the one that I want to pay my rent out of, the direct debits, and that kind of thing. Um, and it's more because when I look at it, I, I, you know, I recommend it to everyone. It's a fantastic app and it works superbly. But I kind of have this feeling that maybe in a week, a month, or two months, it might just all fold over and it might just not be as attractive as, you know, maybe we work. It's not a fintech, but you, you have sort of these tech companies that one day just sort of like don't quite live up to the hype. How do you think they're going to be able to, to get over that sort of like trust? So I feel like that's one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. The question is, how do these leading edge consumer fintechs, many of which offer fantastic experiences, but at the end of the day, we're still talking about people's money. How do you kind of bridge that gap between this is cool, I'd love to use it a few times to I'm going to run my financial life through it. Yeah, so you're definitely not the best customer to a, for Monzo. <laughs> uh, and I suspect you are one of 
many. Um, and that's a big challenge. So if you haven't seen the news today, N26 announced they're pulling out of the UK due to Brexit, despite the fact they launched in the middle of Brexit. It's come as some surprise that Brexit has, has actually happened. So I think that is probably uh, a result of, you know, a challenging acquisition in a competitive market and acquiring uh, customers that they can't um, generate income. I think when we, when I went uh, and talked a little bit earlier about why uh, we were a little reluctant early on in the cycle on challenger banks, it was the unit economics and not many banks have ever made money out of current accounts. And when you launch a current account product and you're not using it as your primary account, which is the key, uh, when it's your secondary, often tertiary account, why are you using it? And a lot of people are using these because venture capital money is subsidizing your wonderful experience. But um, ultimately, the only way these businesses can become sustainable is to generate revenue through cross-selling other products. And so the Monzos and Revoluts uh, and Monizes of the world arguably can get to the point where they do have that critical mass and they are starting to see cross-sell. And I think you know, I don't, I'm not privy to, to Revolut's numbers, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if they are very, very significant now in terms of the usage um, that is coming out uh, and that's flowing through to revenue. So um, trust in financial services is a big thing. And despite the fact that net promoter scores for the big six banks are around 10 and for the challenger banks are north of 70, so that's amazing. Ask why market share hasn't moved dramatically. But you're on a journey, and although you'll be quicker to adopt something like Uber or work in a WeWork, to change your bank, I think the status you more likely to get divorced than change your bank account. Um, so, it, you know, it's it's going to take time, and that's why we are here in 2020, uh, 20 years later than a lot of other industries disrupting, and still the big six after the financial crisis have the market share than they have. But it, it absolutely is changing. Um, you know, millennials are, are very different in their approach. Um, and we are seeing shifting from secondary into primary accounts. For us, I mean, we backed a business called Moneys, which targeted a very specific segment, which was the expat and immigrant community who couldn't open a bank account. So 70% of their customers were primary account depositing salaries because they had no choice. Um, and so that for us was kind of quite compelling. But I think, you know, Monzo would argue that um, I think maybe they said 30% now of their customers are primary account holders, which is, you know, pretty dramatic increase. So you're, you're all on a journey. Um, and as I said, there will be some big winners and there'll be some that fall along the wayside and there'll be consolidation as well, for sure. Excellent. Well, I think we should free this thirsty audience up for uh, drinks at the back and continue the conversation standing up. Thank you very much to Pavel, Ian, Tim and Noel. Please join me in giving the panel a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast. Join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.